Ni hao ma. That's how are you in Chinese. Mandarin Chinese. And we are uh, doing well. And we're here in the Chinese history module where we're going to take a really good look at the cultural achievements and scientific innovations throughout uh, Chinese history and as a cultural backdrop to a deeper exploration of Chinese opera and what is called Peking opera, uh, sometimes referred to as Beijing opera, but Chinese historians prefer Peking opera. So here in the uh, module four at a glance, you can see the different items that uh, we're going to be working on. I'm just going to bang right down the list and go through them. You want to have a look at this video, Lost Civilizations, History of Ancient China. Uh, wonderful video here on uh, from the History Channel on Chinese civilization. I'm going to want to take a very close look at this Chinese history timeline, uh, which is here um, when it's expanded. I'm going to come back to that myself within this lecture. And this segment in uh, Ancient China in the Ancient History Encyclopedia, it's a, a few pages of one continuous sort of scroll down segment. Uh, but it's very detailed and really gets to the heart of a lot of the different dynasties. Now, I want you to have a look here at the discussion assignment, which is sort of ongoing. It's something that you can contribute to throughout the unit and should be familiar with before you start looking at any of the videos or doing any of the reading. The goal of the discussion is to highlight Chinese cultural achievements and scientific innovations throughout history. What we want to do in our first post is to post a, an example of a cultural festival, an artistic innovation, scientific innovation, or other cultural event that took place somewhere in Chinese history. It can be anywhere uh, from ancient history all the way up to uh, contemporary today. We want to offer a description, one paragraph or so, of that festival innovation, scientific innovation, or cultural uh, event. And we want to make sure that this is not something that is already up on the discussion board. So the later, longer you wait, the more you're going to have to read through to make sure you're not duplicating somebody else's example. For the second post, I want you to select someone else's post that's already up and use the timeline offered in the module to identify where exactly the origin of this event falls. So this may be a festival that's practiced in China or was practiced in China over many hundreds of years, but when did it originate? Place that on the timeline. All right. Uh, what was the dynasty? Around what time period? What basic information you can get us, give us about the origin and the timeline origin of that festival. Right. Uh, do not do that to a post that's already been identified on the timeline. In other words, you need to get in there and find one that hasn't been pegged to the timeline yet. For post number three, you choose any discussion thread and comment on the cultural historical significance of this event. So now we'll see uh, a thread that includes two posts, one uh, is just introducing us to this cultural event or this is scientific innovation and the next places it on the timeline now you're going to write a post about the significance of this event and maybe also give us a website where we can look at some more information about this cultural event and expand our dialogue on that cultural event and for the fourth post we want you to dialogue with uh, any students on any of the threads that you participated in, whether it's the one you initiated, the one you added, the timeline post to, or the one that you expanded on and talked about the significance of the event. Any of those threads you can get involved with and just continue the dialogue for your fourth, fifth post, etc. There's also a test at the end of the unit, which you can see down here. Now, I'd like to take some time and talk to you about the Qing Dynasty. That's spelled Q-I-N-G because that's the dynasty 
that was in power during the time that Chinese opera and Peking opera became a real uh, coalesced the theatrical form in China. It's a really interesting period in Chinese history and one that I want to spend a little extra time on. Uh, during this period in Chinese history, China was uh, the largest at its largest in terms of its land mass. It was also the most populous country in the East at this point. And the Qing Dynasty was founded by the Manchu people who came down from uh, the area around Manchuria uh, along with a large population of, of Han people. And these two peoples came together and uh, conquered all of China in the wake of the Ming Dynasty. Now, uh, they had to learn and assimilate many of the concepts and the cultural practices of the people of the plains. So as we're looking here at the map of China, we see that the, the Manchus came from this area and they were ruling all of China. And in order to do that, they really had to assimilate and figure out how to bring an enormously diverse population of people who practiced different religions, spoke different languages, and were from different tribal backgrounds together. And one of that was a challenge that that they were up against during the entirety of of the dynasty, which was almost 300 years in its span from roughly 1644 until 1917, uh, 1912, and then there was a brief restoration in 1917 when China became a republic. So the Qing dynasty was the last Chinese dynasty, and uh, it was a very long-lasting dynasty, and there was a lot of the foundation of Chinese uh, civil service and Chinese government that was found uh, that was put together during this period. One of the biggest challenges that faced them when they uh, took over was the management of the water conservancy and the wa the management of the Yellow River watershed. And we're looking here at the Yellow River, and you can see why it's called the Mother River of China. Uh, it runs basically from the foothills of the Himalayas all the way here to the Sea of Japan. And this is an enormous water system. It feeds and irrigates a vast part of the Chinese plain. Uh, there is a canal that runs from a bend in the Yellow River uh, to Beijing that was built in ancient times and had been ma managed and maintained ever since. It is a gigantic undertaking and it is a major source of uh, transit for goods and services from the, pl from the Chinese plain into the capital region. So this is a, managing this, this water conservancy, uh, managing this watershed is uh, really managing the entire economy of China. And it was in a terrible state of disarray when uh, the Qing Dynasty began in 1644. So the rulers uh, of this dynasty took this on in a uh, serious way. Um, and they were very hands-on governors in terms of uh, the watershed. So what they did was they figured out a way uh, to redirect some of the flow of the Yellow River so that there were not enormous uh, silt deposits at the mouth of the Grand Canal. They uh, built gigantic dikes in all along uh, the Yellow River uh, passage to, to reduce flooding, manage irrigation systems, restore some of uh, the ancient aqueducts that had been built, and just took the entire project over and, and brought it into line. It had an enormous impact on the people and the good faith of the people. Uh, it reduced uh, a lot of uh, insurgency within the population uh, because people were able to farm, they were able to get their goods to market, um, and it was a 
a real triumph for the Qing dynasty and proved that they had the power to rule a, a large landmass uh, and not they weren't just a, a warrior tribe that had swept down and, and come into power. Uh, these policies literally doubled the amount of arable land in China, arable meaning the amount of land that could be farmed. Uh, again, uh, that followed with land reforms, uh, brought a lot of people back to farming, which created uh, 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 obviously a lot of um, uh, agriculture and a lot of agricultural products and, and mitigated a famine that had swept through China at the end of the Ming Dynasty. Um, and using the teachings of Confucianism, uh, the the king the the rulers of the Qing Dynasty reorganized uh, Chinese civil service. So we have an enormous landmass. We have a gigantic population, and what we have is an imperial superstructure, a uh, government superstructure that could either operate uh, under a system of corruption and uh, nepotism and uh, uh, etc., or it could be brought in and operate under a system of merit. So Confucianism has uh, a lot of teachings about uh, respect and good conduct and how society should be organized, and the kings took these teachings very much to heart in their government and created a civil service, uh, even a civil service exam. Now to give you sort of a sense of this, uh, this was taking place in the 18th century. Uh, uh, in the 1700s, uh, the United States did not have a civil service exam for uh, government positions until the 1920s. Uh, by contrast, uh, every government positions in the United States were handed out through patronage and uh, who you knew, et cetera, uh, throughout American history until Calvin Coolidge instituted uh, a, a civil service uh, testing in the 1920s, and the Chinese were doing it in the 18th century under the Qing Dynasty. Again, this was another step in the direction of uh, having uh, creating a great faith among the Chinese people uh, and a unity within the country. Um, the Qing Dynasty uh, adopted uh, Confucianism as a practice and as a teaching and as a way of life, which again bound them to the people of the plains uh, since that was not their, their native uh, practice. Now, towards the end of the, uh, the uh, 17th century, the late 1600s, uh, the dynasty also set up a uh, system of a national research center. Again, initially, this was uh, set up as a way of formulating different mathematic theories to manage the water volume of the Yellow River, so scientists were needed in order to understand water volume, flow rates, all of these things in the dams and the aqueducts of the Yellow River, uh, the need was uh, present and the science was not up to scratch. So the imperial rulers established a national research center and even brought in teachers from abroad to, uh, to work with uh, Chinese scientists and, and develop different ways of managing the resource. Uh, one of the things that followed uh, as time went on was to work on uh, restoration of the great literary works of the Tang Dynasty, and I'm going to talk about that in my second session.